So welcome back. Um, I hope you had a nice restful break. Um, hope you got a chance to get some get some lunch. Uh, this is the seventh panel of the conference on digital Sikhi and the production of knowledge. I'm tremendously excited about this this panel. Um, with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Connor Singh Vanderbeek, who is a composer, media artist, and PhD candidate in ethnomusicology based between the University of Michigan and Vancouver, British Columbia. He works on musical expressions of Canadian Punjabis and how, whether they create for their diaspora community or for the cultural mainstream, their work is always viewed through their racialization. As a musician, he specializes in classical and jazz piano with forays into Indian classical and Sikh devotional musics, Javanese gamelan, and noise music. Vanderbeek also works on Sikh religious music and political history and the racial politics of American hip hop. And he maintains an active art practice. And if he's too humble to, to plug himself, I will say there is a website, um, csvanderbeek.com, which I've been perusing and, and I have to admit, I've been both transfixed and, and moved at the same time, um, looking at, at some of your artwork. So I really appreciated that. And I would invite people Again, that's my invitation. He's not plugging himself, that's me. <laughs> but it's, it's really excellent, um, fascinating work. So today, Connor will be presenting um, Expressing and Justifying Sick Identity in Canadian Arts or the Near Impossibility of Critique. Um, with that, I hand over the digital podium to you. Uh, thank you for that introduction and plug very much, Adam. Uh, and my heartfelt thanks as well to Dr. Pashoda Singh, Dejpal Gurbir, and Adam for organizing and facilitating this conference. Uh, it's a shame that we can't all be there together, but um, like it's been said earlier in the conference, it's made it possible for many more people from many places around the world to be a part of this conference. Um, I'm just going to share my screen for my presentation and make sure that I sound shared as well. Um, okay, I begin by acknowledging that my work takes place on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Just a few of many First Nations who are often overlooked and ignored in the Punjabi quest for visibility in Canada. As I present this paper, I urge us all to consider how Punjabi Sikh settlers in North America have consciously distanced themselves from other racialized groups in order to get ahead in Western society. This presentation focuses on artworks based on chosen traumas of the Canadian Sikh diaspora. A public mural based on the Komogatamaru incident of 1914 that was criticized for embellishing the event to create a false sense of anti-colonial solidarity, and a gallery exhibition centering 1984 that was accused of glorifying Khalistani violence. One second, let me begin the slideshow. I use Katerina Kinball's definition of chosen trauma. Sorry, I read this, this, these events through Katerina's definition of chosen trauma to mean painful historical events around which cultural identity is built. I also draw on Michael Najawan's argument that in 1984, sorry, 1984 in Sikh diaspora, quote, evokes a sense of frozen time, problematizes heterodox perspectives, and consolidates separations between groups. As Najawan's research demonstrates, Canadian Sikhs vociferously protest any negative reading of Khalistani activism and martyrdom. For this presentation, I extend that framework to the Komogatamaru incident, the memory of which is contested between Sikh activists and the Canadian state. I also rely on art critic Zarina Muhammad's polemic on diaspora art, in which she argues that South Asian diasporic pop artists read criticisms of their work as an attack on their identity. However, I flip Muhammad's analysis, instead arguing that critics misread and thus pigeonhole South Asian artworks as, an ex as expressions of a flattened identity, what I refer to as the near impossibility of critique. 
This paper thereby presents two sides of this process. Critics circumscribing the meaning of the Komagatsumaru incident as evoked in the mural, and the South Asian community lambasting criticisms of a work that centers 1984. In summer of 2019, the name of Harry Stevens, the man responsible for denying the Komagatamaru passage into Vancouver, was removed from the government building on 125 East 10th Avenue. To honor this unnaming, Vancouver Mural Festival, Indian Summer Festival, and Naveen Girn unveiled a mural on the backside of this building created by Punjabi artist Kirat Kaur and Musqueam artist Alicia Point and Siler Sparrow Point titled Daike Saya, Cousin Friend. Um, I include these images because as the, the mural is in a back alley, it is somewhat difficult to find. The title Taike Saye is derived from in Punjabi from Taya, father's eldest brother, and Ke belonging to, and Saya, a Musqueam word meaning friend. In the context of British Columbia, Taike refers to First Nations people in proximity to whom Punjabi immigrants lived and worked. The mural depicts indigenous paddlers providing food and supplies to the anti-colonial, largely Gadraic passengers of the Komagatamaru during the ship's two-month docking in Vancouver's Coal Harbor. The mural also shows symbols significant to Kirat Gaur's Punjabi background and Alicia Point's Musqueam heritage. A Punjabi Fulkari pattern, orcas symbolize the ancestors of the Musqueam people protecting the ship and salmon nourishing the traditional custodians of the land. And I'm going to play a short video uh, furnished by the Vancouver Mural Festival for this event. My name is Alicia Point and I come from the Musqueam First Nation. I come, come with my grandson to help do this mural, the coming together of two cultures. I'm just very proud to be part of this historical event that happened in 1914. So what I designed here was just this uh, middle piece. Uh, it's a picture of a two-headed serpent. I love, I love the, the Coast Salish art in, in Vancouver. It's, it's wrapping the city in, in a blanket of spirits. It's also a symbol of reconciliation for us. This building, it's a federal building, and it's named after a former politician named Harry Stevens, instrumental in not allowing the Komagata Maru to dock in 1914. While the passengers were on the ship, their supplies were running low, and so different communities would come out in secret and deliver supplies. And one of those communities were the Coast Salish people. I personally think it's a really beautiful piece because it's bringing together marginalized groups, showing that these groups are still here, working together, building relationships. Vancouver Mural Festival presents the tale of this mural as a true story, which was then reported as fact in a government release and in such media outlets as CTV, the Salish Sea Sentinel, and the Indo-Canadian Voice. A month after the unveiling, York University media scholar Ali Kazemi wrote about how there is no record of Musqueam paddlers ever supplying food to the anti-colonial, predominantly sick passengers aboard the Kamagatsu Maru. As Kazemi writes, quote, if indigenous paddlers managed to take supplies to the ship in spite of an armed blockade, as claimed on the Vancouver Mural website, Mural Festival website, the meaning of the archival record is radically altered. Ali Kazemi and Anne Murphy questioned the validity of the oral sources the curators of this exhibition cited. Mural curator Naveen Kiran maintained that he and his team, a trio of self-trained community historians called the Nameless Collective, had consulted elders in the Punjabi and Musqueam communities in Vancouver, whose ancestors would have been present for the event. When scholars and historians cast doubt on the veracity of the event, Gearn pushed back against the archive. Quote, the archive is a colonial construction. It has very deliberate perspectives on who it sees as a valid source of history. 
If we were to just rely on the archive to tell the stories of marginalized communities, we wouldn't have the resources to tell those stories. Jiren also maintained that the mural is an artistic interpretation and represents how his, the story, histories of indigenous and Indian peoples in Canada have intersected. It's a powerful image of cross-cultural solidarity, but did it really happen, writes Christopher Chung of the Taiyi. Chung's article details reaching out to various people involved in the mural and of the crafting of the story, and the search comes up inconclusive. There is no proof of Musqueam paddlers breaking a British colonial blockade to supply the passengers of the Komodata Maru. There are, however, numerous other examples of Musqueam paddlers welcoming incoming ships to the Vancouver Harbor and offering to sell them fish and supplies, whether white, Chinese, or Japanese. This notion of a special solidarity between South Asians and indigenous paddlers does not hold up. Since the publishing of the story in the Taiyi, City of Vancouver has removed its page promoting the mural. Despite interrogations of the mural itself, the title of the work goes somewhat unquestioned. Ali Kazumi critiques the term thaike, but only in passing. According to Il Kamala Elizabeth Nair's study of Punjabi immigrants to Northwestern BC, thaike from the 1960s to 90s carried negative stereotypes of indigenous people as being poor, lazy, and plagued by alcoholism. By the early 2000s, however, the term was used respectfully but only when the people in question were known and familiar to the speaker. Vancouver Mural Festival, sometime after the city of Vancouver took down the page for the mural, removed the claim of the event as factual and replaced it with a statement noting the complexity of the term thaike as a reflection of South Asian indigenous relations in BC. I found no reference of the term saye or to any significant Coast Salish references of the event. The mural still stands today, initially tucked away in an alleyway between Broadway and residential 10th Ave, but revealed after the Tim Hortons on the corner of Broadway and Main was demolished in early 2021 to make way for a new SkyTrain station. According to city bylaws, the mural will stay up through at least 2021. Ironically, the indigenous contributions to the mural are mostly covered up by construction fencing leaving visible only the least political, most aesthetically pleasing parts of the mural. Uh, the relationship between murals in Vancouver and gentrification is a different topic, but you can see in the left of this picture is a separate mural that was also curated by Vienna. From February 9th until March 23rd, 2019, Mercer Union in Toronto displayed Canadian Sikh artist Nep Sidhu's solo exhibition, Medicine for a Nightmare, they called We Responded, curated by Cheyenne Turnings. Audien Gallery in Vancouver carried the show, which derived its name from a posthumous Sun Ra release, from May 30th to August 3rd, and Esker Foundation carried a variation in Calgary from September 28th until December 20th, 2019. Nepsidhu offers a work in which three people, Sikh, African American, and North American Indigenous, though differently affected by colonialism, can forge a common non-colonial identity through Afrofuturism inflected material collaborations. However, he frames the work, excuse me, frames the exhibition explicitly in terms of 1984. Sidhu's exhibition consists of five parts, at least two of which are born from significant material collaborations with Alouette Tlingit artist Nicholas Gallinin and African-American artist Makoyo Ali Barnes of Black Constellation. The centerpiece of the exhibition is a pair of tapestries on either side of the corner. Axes in polyrhythm, which shows six shasters and weapons, Alouette Tlingit carving tools and cultural forms, and visual motifs referenced elsewhere in the exhibition. The jute fringe suspended from a, from a metal bar at the base of the tapestry billows down onto a bed of red cedar chips, what would be traces of Gallinin's process of carving wood. The second tapestry, titled Medicine for a Nightmare, 
shows two turbaned figures convening on either side of what appears to be the throne of the Guru Granth Sahib. Gold, black, and cream colored tapestries drape from the top corners of the frame. Six shastras and weapons sit at the base of a red and brown carpet. Much of the remainder of the tapestry consists of the repetitious pulsating motifs typical of black constellation works, morphing into daggers and swords. Jute also drapes from this tapestry, but the fringe terminates into cut hair that directly touches the floor with five shastras placed atop it. In a series of sculpted busts named The Books and Scriptures Were Stolen, Our Steel is Forever, Nepsidu and Makoyo Ali Barnes work between voodoo and Afro-Caribbean medicine practitioners and Sidhu's signature metalwork and ornaments characteristic of Nihang turbans. Two of the figures wear hats crafted by a Hollywood hat maker, Gunnar Fox, and Tokyo-based Australian hat maker Tom O'Brien, while the third figure sports braids with plastic and metal beads. Other aspects of the exhibition include a large concrete structure atop a bed of dirt that memorializes the Sick Reference Library. A monitor displays a 23-minute film mixing footage of a black Sikh washing his hair, of Kirten, of 1984 survivor testimonials, and of a Sun Ra performance with VHS visual processing. And a window display at the Audain Gallery's version shows metal section plates commonly used in London halls. Critiques of the exhibition focused on 1984. The two threads of critique for Sidhu's exhibition were one, accusations that he was perpetuating dangerous and factually incorrect versions of the Khalistani movement and two, assertions that Sidhu could not read 1984 through a non Punjabi Sikh aesthetic framework without being accused of false equivalency or appropriation. This is despite Sidhu having already established himself as a Sikh artist who works with Afrofuturist concepts. The original exhibition text referred to the Khalistani movement as an activist movement and to Jarnal Singh Pindranwale as a community leader. Ali Kazumi was especially disturbed by how the Mercer Union iteration brochure misrepresented, misrepresented history, criticizing how, quote, the fundamentalists who shot and bombed innocents and openly assassinated fellow Sikhs are now being reconstructed as peaceful activists, end quote. The South Asian Visual Arts Center in Toronto expressed similar concern that the exhibition perpetuated a narrative of six in the Khalistani movement as victims of the state who themselves did not engage in acts of violence or intimidation. Mercer Union later issued an apology for their original curatorial statement and released a revised statement and bibliography, citing consultation with SABA. Vince Rosario critiques the work's valorization of weapons while also peacefully advocating for the formation of Khalistan. He also finds the collaborations with Ali Barnes and Gallen in shallow, writing, quote, proximity to blackness and indigeneity is not the same as solidarity, and pointing to aesthetic similarities is a largely symbolic and passive way of drawing intercommunity connections, end quote. Similarly, Kazumi panned the work for comparing indigenous peoples' ongoing struggles under settler colonialism with the Sikh, quote, fight for an ethno-religious theocratic state in South Asia, end quote. In an interview with Rachna Rajgod in Canadian Art, Sidhu dismisses accusations of false equivalency and appropriation. He speaks of Black experience and of several incarnations of the Black body but makes no mention of how his collaborators contribute to that conceptualization. He addresses critique by calling it performative satire, accusing his critics of embarrassing themselves and saying they trip over their own manicured punchline, especially readings of the work as overly militant or masculinist. Siddha responded to Cosme's critique on Instagram calling the scholar, quote, a very large problem to the six, six students who attend the programming, end quote, at York University. He accused Cosme of knowing nothing about Sikhs or Sikh history and said Cosme had stupid glasses, 
was a pawn of the Indian state and belonged to yet another colonialist university. Sidhu attacked Rosario's position and accused other critics of having not actually seen or engaged with the work. Comments on the Instagram posts supported Sidhu's stance and further demeaned Kazumi and Rosario, typical of the kind of self of insular self-celebration Zarina Muhammad observes in her piece on South Asian diaspora art. Queer and feminist Sikh artists with whom I've spoken are afraid to speak publicly about Nepsidhu's work, fearing retaliation from the artist and from Kalafani Sikhs. No one from within the Sikh community has publicly critiqued Nepsidhu's exhibition, art practice, or open hostility towards critics. The number of Punjabis in Canadian arts is quite small relative to the size of the diaspora in the country, and it is best to not make any enemies within that community. To close, there are two points I wish to take away from these examples. First is the portrayal of cultural traumas and how the players behind these works, these two works, defend the right to tell their own stories when critics approach the works, regardless of what the critique is actually about, reflecting Nijawan's point that mainstream 1984 narratives problematize heterodox perspectives. The conversation surrounding the mural called into question who has the right to, to tell the definitive history of the Komagatamara incident. Well, diasporic six, including those who did not want to get caught in the crossfire, stood quietly as Nepsidu bullied critics of his exhibition. The second point is that the conversations surrounding these works largely miss their artistic content, the material practices, the cultural aesthetics, and so on. Medicine for a Nightmare and Daike Saye both invite the potential for conversations to occur across cultural groups affected by colonialism and state violence. That potential for Nepsidhu disappeared when he evoked 1984, and the backlash against him was ultimately because he tried to juxtapose and, according to critics, equate Sikh persecution in India with indigenous experiences of settler colonialism and land loss, and with the Black Atlantic experience of slavery. The imagination of solidarity in Daike Saye was tabled when discussions of the work fixated on registers of historical records and alighted the decades that Punjabis and First Nations have in small laboring communities in BC, worked alongside one another and slowly come to mutual recognition. In the era of the ethnic enclave, the solidarities are separated back out, their history is segregated once again. When identity is so closely tied to contentious historical events, it is difficult to create space for any interpretation other than that which serves the identity formation. This is especially the case when those claiming the events perceive themselves to still be marginalized. But this process can backfire and can be used to recreate divisions rooted in colonial segregation or post-colonial identity politics. The focus on, on history overlooks the fact that Coast Salish and Punjabi artists imagined a cultural and aesthetic solidarity. The fixation on 1984 silences the roles of Nepsidhu's collaborators in Black Constellation and quashes the decolonial potential of the work. Identity and history alike remain frozen. Uh, thank you, and I apologize if I ran over on time. We're doing just fine on time, perfectly. Thank you so much, Connor. Let's see, we, we move now uh, to the second panelist, Dr. Nirvikar Singh, who I have the, the honor and the privilege of introducing uh, and meeting yet again um, at this conference. Uh, Dr. Nirvikar Singh is Distinguished Professor of Economics at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he held the Sarjit Singh Aurora Chair of Sikh and Punjabi Studies from 2010 to 2020. His research includes economic theory, development economics, political economy, and an, an award-winning book on Indian Americans. He has written on several aspects of Punjab's economy, and serves on the Chief Minister's Expert Group on Revitalizing the Punjab Economy. In Sikh Studies, his work includes essays on Sikh identity, history, entrepreneurship, art, literature, 
and on translating the Guru Granth Sahib and presenting uh, today, Dr. Nirvikar Singh is presenting his paper, Asymmetries of Power in Knowledge Production, The Case of Six Studies. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to uh, get the chance to learn from you yet again. I'll, I'll hand over the electronic podium to you, uh, Dr. Nirvikar Singh. Thank you so much, Adam. It's so uh, nice to uh, be uh, able to uh, participate in, in today's uh, conference. And uh, well, no, this, no. This, this is really just wonderful. Um, and uh, the best part of presenting actually is for the first time, I, I'm able to see uh, who's listening. <laughs> uh, that's been one of the disadvantages of the webinar format is, you know, I haven't, aside from seeing faces, not seeing faces, I haven't even been able to see who's attending. So I, I'm, I'm glad to see some familiar names in the participant list and let me just say hello to everyone and hope you're doing well. Uh, it's, it's been a really challenging year and I hope you're all uh, surviving and even thriving. Um, so um, um, it's, it's uh, nice to be included in the conference. Uh, I think I was gonna be the last speaker, but uh, I've, circumstances have bumped me up by one position. And sometimes I think it's because the um, organizers or my colleagues in six studies don't quite know what to do with me um, and uh, you know as, as a participant in six studies but uh, uh, maybe I can just appeal to <clears throat> uh, fluidity and say that uh, you know uh, I don't I'm, I'm not always an economist <laughs> so um, and uh, I also want to thank the organizers in general it's been a really wonderful stimulating conference and uh, a lot of uh, you know, the, the panel yesterday was great. Uh, some very impressive presentations by young scholars, and uh, I, I know there's many scholars who haven't presented this time. So the, I mean, the field really is is in good shape. And you may be surprised to hear me say that because I think I'm normally uh, uh, known as as kibitzing rather than the opposite. But uh, so I've I've learned a lot from the conference, and uh, I was also glad to see that some of the themes I'm going to touch on came up in earlier sessions. Often actually um, you know, verbalized in uh, ways that are more sophisticated than, than I can manage. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> you've all seen this quote uh, many, many times. I'm sure it, it pops up all over. The exercise of power perpetually creates knowledge and conversely knowledge are constantly in the effects of power. And in some sense, this is, the, this is my, my theme and I'm going to illustrate it with some examples, some specific examples in six studies as the title of my paper says. I, I'm not necessarily following Foucault though exactly because um, uh, when I talk about knowledge, I uh, sometimes want to put it in inverted commas. So I'm actually, and I, I don't know if, I doubt if Foucault would agree with this. I want to distinguish somewhat sharply between knowledge with inverted commas and uh, knowledge uh, without inverted commas. And I realize that, you know, that it's difficult to draw uh, uh, a really bright line between the two, but I think there is a uh, distinction and it's our job as academics to uh, you know, make that, uh, draw that line as best we can. Um, <clears throat> the, it, the, um, this issue of categorization actually made me think of, um, and also identities made me think of fuzzy set theory. So um, uh, I was going to joke that, uh, you know, my ambition is to, uh, write a paper on Sikh history as a stochastic process using fuzzy set theory, but that's not going to be today. Um, so, okay, so I'm not necessarily, uh, you know, following Foucault exactly. And uh, all I want to say is that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, should, uh, we should look at some of the, uh, you know, uh, knowledge base that, that we have in the field. And uh, if, I, if I could use a metaphor, a Sikh metaphor, uh, I'm, I'm mostly going to be uh, very Western. I'm trying to adopt the position of an objective outsider. I realize again that that's, you know, uh, that has its own problems, to that, even that claim. Uh, and I'm doing it because I think that in order to engage with some of this uh, uh, material and some of the presentations that I'm going to, or, or the ideas that I'm going to address, I think one has to uh, deal with the West on its own terms. Uh, which is a little different from some of the you know, other, other perspectives we've had. Um, in any case, uh, my sixth metaphor is that rather than uh, you know, 
uh, contributing to the building of a, a wonderful uh, ed edifice, which I think all of you are doing. I'm, I'm uh, doing a little bit of car seva and helping to uh, clean out the sarova. So I uh, hope you'll take my uh, contribution in that spirit. Um, okay, so my five examples, and they're, they're really heterogeneous. Um, uh, Guru Nanak and the Sants, I think that's the one I've worked on the most and is, is for me the clearest. The impact of the Singh Sabha, which in some sense um, has come to dominate our perspectives uh, on, in, in Sikh studies, especially in the West. Um, and then uh, I think, so, so I think there are some sharp things to be said there. And the remaining three are, are a little more amorphous and I'll, I'll try not to uh, overstate my claims there, the nature of the diversity in Sikhism. And you can see I'm using Sikhism. I'm not going to be very, again, uh, uh, you know, hard and fast about Sikhi versus Sikhism and so on, because also I feel like, you know, why should I as a Sikh be precluded from using Western terms? And uh, uh, so I, I'm inspired by Humpty Dumpty and Alice in Wonderland there. Um, the, so the nature of diversity in Sikhism, the impact of colonialism and the Sikh diaspora. And as I go through these, I'll have less and less to say. Uh, as I go down this list. So anyway, I'm going to oversimplify. I've got a very long paper. I've sent it to hopefully most of you, multi sometimes multiple times. If anybody wants the paper, please just write to me or uh, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to share it. Uh, I'm really uh, welcoming of criticism. Somebody already shared my paper with Robin Cohen, who I critique right in the beginning of my paper. And he immediately sent me a very nice email saying, you know, tell me what I said wrong. And I told him, it'll take me a few days to, to <laughs> he said, take a few moments. I said, it'll take me a few days. So I, I was really uh, pleased with that, you know, after nobody having brought attention to his mistakes for 20 years, as soon as somebody did, he responded immediately. Okay, so um, this is the one I think is, is should be the easiest actually to uh, accept. Um, they uh, claim that Guru Nanak is uh, a member of the Sant tradition. And I'm not going to go into the details of the intellectual genealogy of this, but it's pretty clear that the Sant tradition is a 19th century construct. And really, if, if you read the literature by Western scholars, it's conceptually and empirically very, very fragile. And Something that the Western scholars don't seem to want to acknowledge is that it's not at all a neutral uh, idea, the Sant tradition. And really it has its roots in, uh, in um, uh, a project of Hindi, Hindu nationalism, not, you know, not the Hindu, Hindutva of Golwalkar and so on, Savarkar, but still very much uh, that general project of cultural nat nat nationalism. And uh, yet Western scholars treat it as if it's, oh, this is a neutral scholarly term. And so I, I think it's, it's really problematic. And I think what, if, if one rejects the Sant tradition, then of course, Guru Nanak was not a Sant. But I think there's a very, very easy case to make that um, uh, even if you want to call something a Sant tradition, that Guru Nanak doesn't fit into it. And, uh, you know, I've written a whole paper on it. I've kind of rehashed that paper a couple of times already. So uh, please uh, uh, look at the details and I hope I'll convince some of you at least. Okay, so this is the, <laughs> this is the one that is always the most uh, contentious. And uh, uh, so uh, I hope I don't uh, offend anybody, but uh, really the popular academic narrative here is oversimplified and distorted. Um, I think it mischar mischaracterizes the process that occurred during the Singh Sabha, as well as not really, um, uh, not really um, properly understanding and describing what came before the Singh Sabha or what came after the Singh Sabha. It's sort of like this, you know, everything is Singh Sabha and before and after. And it's actually, uh, I guess this is going to be recorded, so it's, it's almost as bad as saying it in writing, but it, it's really a terrible analysis, uh, the popular academic narrative. And, uh, you know, when I've talked about this to, to other uh, scholars, they've said, well, but then you have to come up with an alternative. So I've started to do that in this paper, and really a more nuanced and accurate narrative of reform and evolution is, is not difficult to, to craft, and really it should have been done by now. 
Uh, you know, you can see little bits of it in some of the book reviews that uh, came out after um, uh, after this thesis was originally proposed in its you know popular form. Uh, you know, I've quoted uh, a little bit of Nikki Singh's review, and then you know, there's a whole essay by uh, Jagdar Singh Greval on this, and uh, you know, there's more, a lot more one can say. So really, I think we need to move beyond this because, in some sense, it's really, I think, um, you know, held back held back the field of uh, six studies and really has created, I think, a gap between uh, the academic field and the community, which has a very different understanding of itself. Okay, we can come back to this later. Um, so now I'm getting into, you know, fuzzier, fuzzier um, and broader um, issues. So these are not quite as clear cut, but I would argue that the treatment of diversity in Sikhism in Western academia is often empirically weak. By that, I mean that often what you get is a list, a laundry list of categories without really any um, clear discussion or you know, systematic analysis of what these, what these um, categories mean and how they're related to each other and so on. And again, you know, uh, I'm just an economist, but Jagdar Singh Gewal says exactly the same thing. And uh, you know, he, he tends to say it very, very sort of plainly in a few sentences. And so people don't realize what a strong statement he's making. So there's no flowery language or anything, but really, uh, you know, one, one can make a very detailed uh, uh, case that, uh, you know, the, the typical treatment of diversity is, is really not very well done. I should say that um, um, I think, you know, um, after I'd, I'd written the paper and circulated it, you know, kept on sort of looking at stuff and, uh, I came across a nice paper by uh, uh, Jasdeep Singh at Leeds uh, on diversity in, in, you know, among uh, Khalsa Sikhs in, in, the, in the UK. And I thought that was a really, um, you know, at least from a social scientist perspective, was a good model of how to do things systematically. You know, maybe everybody won't agree with me, but uh, I, for me, that, that was uh, very useful. Um, so the other issue here with the nature of diversity and how it's treated is uh, that normative judgments are often made without transparency. So what happens is that scholars take sides and these are issues, you know, the question of, you know, what is the proper locus of diversity within the Sikh tradition? You know, this, is, this has been debated since, you know, Guru Nanak, uh, you know, the succession to Guru Nanak and uh, it's debated now and there's, you know, multiple, uh, you know, ways in which that, that uh, diversity gets expressed and content, contested and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we are gonna take sides, then I think we have to, um, we have to uh, you know, be, be a little more transparent about it. And here actually, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because we often worry about, you know, Hindutva and RSS and so on. But often what I see here is, you know, Western scholars really trying to look good to or Western scholars of six studies trying to look good to, uh, you know, liberal, their liberal colleagues, you know, and, and sort of uh, saying, yeah, you know, all diversity is good. And, you know, we, we, we just love everybody and uh, everything is great. And <laughs> I think it's more complicated than that. So anyway, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think I have any special expertise to decide, for example, who is a Sikh or who is, you know, good Sikh and so on. But I think scholars sometimes slip into that, you know, ish, uh, and, uh, uh, I've given some examples in, in the paper. So anyway, uh, so here the, the power asymmetries really come from, I think, from both from outside academia and also, you know, how how the uh, how Western academia organizes itself. And uh, you know, again, I, I I think I'll have to expand this paper into a book, which which uh, uh, I don't know if I'll ever have the stamina to do that. But uh, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of complicated methodological issues here as well as empirical issues. Okay, moving on, the impact of colonialism. Um, this is sort of the, the, um, you know, the other bookend of the argument that the Singh Sabha were aggressive usurpers or the Tatkhalsa were aggressive usurpers. And this, the, the sort of, I think this sort of, I think there's a problem with the whole post-colonial literature. I'm not the only one who's saying it now, I think, and uh, where it gives over, it, it over, in some sense, uh, gives too much power to, to the colonialists and, uh, uh, really, I think the characterization of Sikhs as you know, Sikhs somehow victims of colonialism is problematic. And uh, I, I think 
also just the binary between you know six and uh, uh, the British often gets uh, you know over focused on, and uh, of course it's it the full context is more complicated because you do have you know uh, other communities in in the Punjab in, in particular, and of course the you know the role of the Arya Samaj is very very important in in this story. Uh, so and, and of course the Arya Samaj in Punjab in the 1870s is uh, you know another strand which later meets up with uh, the Hindutva of, of uh, Savarkar. So uh, you know I think looking at it from that perspective is useful. At the same time, I don't think it's necessary to kind of characterize the Sikh response even to the Arya Samaj. And you know, I'm thinking of them, you know, ritually shaving the heads of Sikhs and converting them to uh, to uh, Hinduism. You know, which was a to the Arya Samaj version of Hinduism, which was a you know big big deal at that time, of course. I don't think one necessarily has to think of that the response as you know as, as, as somehow you know traumatizing the community. One can equally think of the Sikh responses as being you know positive and strategic. And of course, there's a lot of debate and argument, and sometimes it's very bad tempered. But um, you know, I, again, I think I think you know sometimes scholars end up kind of projecting a little onto onto the community at that time. And that some of the problem is we don't need, read enough of the original sources and uh, sufficient breadth of the original sources in Punjabi. And, uh, you know, that that's, of course, uh, something that it requires a, another PhD dissertation or two or three or more. So uh, it's not something I've attempted here, but I, I just want to highlight this. Okay, the final topic, <laughs> this is, you know, the broadest of all. And um, all I want to say here is that some treatments of the Sikh diaspora foreshorten or ignore Sikh history. And this is, you know, there's certainly lots of exceptions to this. I think this is a reflection of some of the history of the field that was discussed yesterday. That, um, you know, 1984 kind of created this sort of, uh, you know, the six became became, uh, you know, a hot topic for for scholars. And so, uh, you know, that there's this sort of uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a market right in, in of, of ideas in academia. Well, you know, whether we like it or not. And so this, be, you know, the six with 1984 became a marketable, much more marketable and, you know, fitting into, you know, broader concerns about, you know, terrorism and religious nationalism and so on and so on. Anyway, you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, 1984 has been hugely important and events around that have been important. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> my, my wife and I were in Delhi and, you know, uh, I, we thought we were going to die on, you know, November first. <laughs> so uh, I, I can't say it's unimportant, and I, you know, there, for many Sikhs, it, it was much worse. But I, th I think, you know, in the in the bigger picture of Sikh history, it often gets, uh, you know, uh, scholars who came into the field relatively sort of, you know, jumped in at this stage, sometimes uh, don't really pay enough attention to, you know, the the the, the whole arc of Sikh history. And that shouldn't be a controversial thing. There's also this issue of, you know, Punjabi versus Sikh. And uh, I have some examples in the paper where Punjabi gets foregrounded as the group label. label. And sometimes that hides certain issues which, uh, you know, are, I think, unique to uh, Punjabi Sikhs. And, you know, again, you know, we've discussed the, the overlaps and uh, differences between the two categories. And, you know, certainly sometimes, uh, members of the Sikh community prefer the term Punjabi and that that's absolutely fine that's uh, everybody's right to you know choose what they want to kind of be, be uh, uh, labeled as it's, it's very interesting though that uh, for I think in the US census now for the first time we had the category Sikh and we'll see where that goes so I think this is a political choice but I think it should be the community's choice and not something that is determined by uh, western scholars again who are kind of interpreting the community interpreting us for ourselves. And again, that, that's sort of the power move that I have, have a, an issue with. Um, okay, so um, I want to say that, you know, I really tried hard to make this about, you know, certain arguments and not about people because that's been a problem in the field where, you know, things get personalized and it, it actually inhibits discussion. And I think, you know, I, I've seen in this conference, I think we're getting away from that. And, um, uh, certainly, this paper is not about defending tradition, you know, or tr necessarily traditional accounts, or defending power asymmetries within the community. You know, they're there, 
And uh, again, I'm not going to take sides. I just want to say that there's this other stuff going on. And certainly I'm, I'm not uh, uh, promoting exclusion or any exclusionary you know, approach in, in scholarship. I, I think you know, we, have to, we have to do this together. So it, it is about promoting rigor, about uh, you know, being conceptually rigorous as well as empirically rigorous. However you want to mix those two you know, and where the role of interpretation is, then we can differ on that. And uh, I think we have to do that uh, in the face of multiple sources of power, which, uh, which uh, really affect us as a community. And I've, I've actually been recently involved in a project, I won't go into detail, where uh, people from outside the community basically took charge. And uh, when I complained, uh, then somebody else from the community would be designated as a surrogate to attack me. And to me, that's, that's the, you know, the, the, the illustrates the problem of uh, six studies where you know we're, we're supposed to fight among ourselves while uh, you know somebody else uh, kind of just looks on um sorry that sounds a little bit too uh, too uh, whiny so uh, don't, don't worry too much about it but in terms of in terms of you know this this issue of anti-intellectualism and distance from the community let me finish with something which is not in the paper and uh, that's that actually, and this is something I've really realized over the last uh, you know, year. And uh, you know, it, it's some of the terrible things that have happened in this country, plus the pandemic you know, locking me in the house to watch lots of cable news. I see African-American academics really engaging uh, very, very productively with the concerns of uh, the African American community, and you know, we we talked about some of this in, in the panel yesterday, uh, you know, about um, you know activism and scholarship, and actually this morning too, uh, or yeah, uh, maybe early afternoon, um, where you know we we, we um, are sort of you know engaging with the community and their their sort of social concerns, and uh, I I think. That's really where we should be, you know, figuring out how to do that, and without without sort of getting into this intellectual versus anti-intellectual <clears throat> binary, which I, I don't think we need, we need to at all. Uh, so uh, uh, I actually wasn't looking at uh, uh, a clock, but uh, I think I'd better stop here, <laughs> and otherwise I'll, I'll go on and on, and uh, maybe we'll have time in Q and A. Thank you. Thank you, and Sardvi Kala. Thank you so much. And that's actually a perfect 20 minutes. Um, so, so we move now to uh, Dr. Dalver uh, Panu. Since the partition of British India in 1947 and the subsequent creation of the dominions of India and Pakistan, these two countries have been entangled in several wars, conflicts, and military standoffs. Dr. Dalver S. Panu, a dentist from California has been working on unearthing the secular narratives from the Sikh religious monuments and literature displaced during these two nations partition. During his decade long research in South Asia, Dr. Panu has revealed the consistent unavailability of coherent reading material written through a neutral lens. To fill this void, he was inspired to write the book, The Sikh Heritage Beyond Borders, published in 2019. As recognized by the California Legislative Assembly in March 2021, his monumental research has been acknowledged as a valuable resource to expand academicians and policymakers' understanding of the forgotten Sikh uh, heritage in Pakistan to promote peace and stability in South Asia. Today, Dr. Panu will be presenting on the Sikh heritage in Pakistan, scope of academic research. Um, and we're delighted uh, to have you join us in the panel. Uh, I will hand over the virtual podium uh, to you now, Dr. Delver Panel. Thank you so much, everyone. First of all, it's a great honor to be uh, part of this panel. It has been a dream. And today I can literally say with thanks of Baba Nanak, my dream has come true. Um, many of you have been contacting during the part of my research. And I would really like to say thanks to all of you who have been uh, very valuable in returning my emails or my phone calls whenever I needed in the past uh, about a decade or so. So as we have a very limited time uh, without taking too much time on the introduction, I'll get started to the topic. My topic is 
modely what I will be speaking to, you know, many of you are very senior historians, some are students. I will be speaking more to the students. You know, I'm telling them, telling you guys, what is my modus operandi? Like, you know, what I'm trying to do to improve the awareness of the scope of academic research in Pakistan. How I'm utilizing those buildings? Because many people ask, what is in Pakistan? You know, there are a few good words here and there. We can do the research while sitting from here too. So that's what I will like to explain that sky is the limit. When we talk about the Sikh heritage in Pakistan, how much research work the academic world can do, the sky is the limit. And I will give a few examples as I have done. So all the examples I'll be giving be from my, this book, The Sikh Heritage Beyond Borders. First of all, the biggest, uh, I would say, the issue that we find about Sikh history research is that most of our historical records are either in Gurmukhi or they're in Farsi. And the inscriptions which are on these buildings on these monuments in Pakistan, uh, they are also mostly in Gurmukhi. So the international historians, researchers, or uh, students in Western world, though they can read Gurmukhi, but many of these are ancient type of Gurmukhi, so it becomes very difficult. So when I was done with photography and all of, of my work before the time of social media in Pakistan, I have worked in, on about 270 monuments in Pakistan. When I presented the work to my academician friends in Pakistan, they said, there is nothing new for us. We walk by these buildings all the time. Uh, tell us what is the meaning of these inscriptions? What is the history behind this? So that's when I started this. First work was to interpret what these buildings, inscriptions which are inlaid on the marbles there, what does that mean? And I started uh, translating them into English and I put it all together. So I'll give you a few examples. How each chapter I expanded to, to give proper tools to the students who want to work on these buildings. So this is Pai Feru's place. This is Sangatia Sahib. You know, this is one of the sect, called Musans also. Now on its main door, this is a slab. Its first line say, Sri Guru Sangat Sahib Ji Pandrami Patshahi. So it says 15th Patshahi. So when many people read this line, you know, they will saying, okay, in six, there are 10 Patshahis, there are 10 Gurus, 11th is Guru Granth Sahib, what is Pandrami Patshahi? So I used that as an opportunity to explain in my book, if you see the very last line on this page, that you know, this is how the succession of the Mahants was going on. This Pandrami Pashai is a descendant, Mahant Haridas, which, who constructed the floor of this building on the Gintri gates. So giving them the meaning of the Gaddis, which still continue to go in succession in these places, helps us to understand the people that how Sikhism eventually evolved. And in the same building, we were able to include Pai Kan Singh Naba's court, and this was the place where Guru Nanak Dev Ji's topi and godri was placed. Similarly, any chapter, I tried to include some local uh, narratives from the local people so that the people, the students, the historians in that particular locality, they can start doing the research on these buildings. In the same building, Gurdwara Sangat Sahib, we see this for many of you who can read Gurmukhi, this is very easy to read. But people who cannot read Gurmukhi, especially the students in Pakistan, for them to understand, Right in that chapter, I translated it into English, which shows that Sukhasan is the, this is Sukhasan Astan. This is the, the name for the protocol normally used by the Sikhs at the end of the day to retire Shri Guru Granth Sahib. And in the same one, we were able to include, you know, certain Mughal documents, like what happened there. And then to get interest of the modern theory, you know, we were able to include who gave donations for these buildings. Lena Singh Mujitia Pangi missile, uh, Mahant Tal Das received from uh, Ran Singh Nakai. These were the missiles before Maharaja and Jisang period. So when we see any building in Pakistan like this, it gives a wonderful opportunity to expand it up to different levels. You know, there are different annals of history and different timelines you can go. Even from the Mughal time, there is a grant that I found, a Sanat, which was giving money that was, this place was being patronized even by the Mughal uh, rulers time then in the British time, and then the missiles time, and then Maharaji Singh time. And in the modern time during uh, Gurdwara Sudha Arlaya, later on, uh, when SGPC was formed, uh, there was a Chabiya da Morcha, Gurdwara Pai Firu da Morcha. So we can cover all the different periods of history on most of these buildings in Pakistan. I'll go, go to the another example. So this is the same, which I'm showing. This is the interior of it, the same place. If you see, this is Chabutra, which is most probably Prakashistan, but behind it, there is a Niai Snish. And here on this page, I'm trying to show you a British period document which says name of grantor held since the times of the Delhi emperors for the last 160 years. Now, this document I'm showing is from 1853. And it's telling 
that there is a grant going on from 160 years. Date of grant is 1693 AD by Pai Feru and that tells the whole story. So using these ancient sources, we are making the people in Pakistan start adopting these buildings, not to see as non-Islamic or buildings belonging to Sikh religion, because we are using so many ancient documents that they start getting interest into this building. That is one of my modus operandi. This is a very common structure you will find in Pakistan. The middle structure, the central sectum, because it has a dome on it, it has a sturdy structure, it is stable. All the other side rooms, they have been banished by the forces of nature. And over there, whatever we see in Gurmukhi, if you see here, Panjipi Alay, Panjipi, Shadam Peer, Betha Gurpari, this is the line by Pai Gurdas. This is on the same Gurdwara. Those who can read Gurmukhi can easily read it. But when we show it as an English translation to the international scholars, that the Gurmukhi inscription reads, Gurdwara Shri Guru Har Gobind Sahib Ji and Guru Rai Sahib Ji, it changes the whole prospect of this, this building. Same thing here, uh, we are including the translation of whatever is written there as an inscription. And then we are trying to quote some other things related to that area. Let's say this particular Gurdwara, this is fifth and sixth Gurdwara, but that also gives us an opportunity to, to relate it that this village was the birthplace of Dr. Divan Singh Kalepani, who was a great poet, physician, and philanthropist who was sent to Kalepani in Andaman. And this village is also the village of Pai Dayal Singh, who wrote Fatenama about uh, the Shah Zaman's fight with the uh, Saif Singh Pangi. Now, the minute you use Shah Zaman, that attracts the local history students. They know about Shah Zaman very well. That's a character that they read all the time. So that's the purpose. That's how I've been trying to include uh, the local people in these buildings. So my next is, how do we generate interest of local? This one was to translate the things into English. Either it's from Farsi, ancient Indo-Farsi, or the Gurmukhi ones. Second is, we all know Pakistan is an Islamic country. We need to give some kind of flavor that these buildings are not just, uh, you know, there is, of course, we all know that in Sikh history, Mughal history, the same war has been won by one by Sikhs. And in uh, Pakistan's history, in their textbook, I see the same war has been won by uh, the Muslims. So how do I uh, cover that so that, you know, students from both these countries can read, let's say, in a virtual classroom without feeling offended? So what I have done is, so let's say this is Gurdwara Rodi Sahib. When I go there, they say, Oh, let's take you. I have a lot of friends in Pakistan. I visit there quite often. I'm going there since last 12 years. They will say, okay, there's a Gurdwara near Gujranwala. Let's take you there. It's Sikhanda Gurdwara. But when I go there in my book, I highlighted this picture. It says the donation given by Thekedar Murad Baksh, Uttar Saraj Din Dirji, Muradpura. And I tell them, hey, the donation was given by a Muslim here. Similarly, you find tons of donation slabs by Hindus. So these buildings were built by locals who were like from any sect, people were much more tolerant there. In those times, pre-partition times, the divisions were not like this, like people used to give money to these places. So when I show this kind of slab in a larger piece to the local school, I tell them, don't just see this as a Sikh Gurdwara. The money was given by local Muslims too. It changes their whole ideology about the place. So that's how I've been trying to include them. This is another example. This is Gurdwara Nanak Sar, Path Shaipeli. Now it's being used as a cattle shed. What I did was in the ancient books, I found out what was the condition to, to generate interest of the students. I found, by the way, this is the page of my book. If you see under the name of the chapter, I have given the latitude longitude also, 32.32. That means anyone who cannot visit Pakistan can easily punch in these numbers on your Google map and you will actually virtually be able to see that place. Also, as it's not easy to find the locations within Pakistan, the students from cities, big cities like Lahore, Islamabad, they are using this number now to access it. But to generate their interest, though there was not a big history associated with this Gurdwara, I found this ancient old book written in 1924, in which it is written, these lines, I'll tell its English translation, when it was written that this is 12 miles northeast of Gujranwala railway station, the income of the shrine is modest, the village is predominantly of Muslim population. After the paved road, there is additional two miles of dirt track to reach here and a special ride has been arranged. That made all the you know, children, all the students in the class to kind of give a laugh because now even there, there are good motorways. They couldn't even believe that there used to be a, a dirt track to reach there and a special ride had to be arranged. So that just creates curiosity in the, in the local people. And then in the Sikh heritage book, I have included chapters like Zir Khan Mosque. This is a very famous monumental place in Pakistan. And a lot of people got upset, many Sikhs, 
like they said, oh, Wazir Khan, he killed the, uh, he was responsible for killing of Gobind Singh Ji's children, but uh, we made it clear this is a different Wazir Khan. This was associated, he was a very good friend actually of 5th Guru Sahib and 6th Guru Sahib, and I included the Shabd here, Allah Agam Khudai Bande, Shod Khyal Duniya Ke Tande. That's the whole story regarding Sukhmani Sahib. So he was in the good offices of Sikh Gurus. In fact, whatever I learned and I've given very large detail in this chapter, he has a lot of contribution towards Sixth Guru Sahib and, uh, you know, Jahangir's association. And when Sixth Guru Sahib, he had to leave Amritsar towards Kartarpur Sahib. So Wazir Khan has a lot of role at that time when the uh, Sikh community, Sikh religion, it was transferring from the earlier uh, path up to Fifth Gurus, which there were no arms included, and then Sixth Guru started adopting arms. So Wazir Khan has a very major role in that transition. And that this kind of chapter helps us to show the secular nature of overall Sikh culture that Wazir Khan's mosque should be a part of the Sikh tourists who are going there and a, and a place for research. Similarly, Shrine of Hazrat Abdul Qadir Gilani Sani. I'm very fond of reading the Janam Sakhis and trying to find out which one is true, which one is most probable, just like how McLeod has done. I'm a big fan of his work. So these are the Sakhis and I read from all different Janam Sakhis, try to find out the ancient manuscripts and the difference among manuscripts. So this is the place if you see, no Sikh ever goes there. I haven't seen anyone going there, but this is where Guru Sahib had a Goshti with the uh, Kadar Gilani Sani, where, you know, now near Chengiyaya, Sat Paramaltan was, Othe, Amal Glola, Kurka, Ditta Devanhar, Mati Maram Visariya, Kusi Kita Denchar. So when to the Sikh devotees, you show that this is the place where Gurbani's composition, the discussion actually happened. It helps to promote love among the communities. It gives opportunity for the students in Amritsar in Ludhiana, in Chandigarh, in Delhi. Oh, wow. Let's go to that site. Maybe it's just day trip. Once the situation improves, which I'm very optimistic, one day India Pakistan will get together. Students can go to these sites and they can actually enjoy the place because I feel you need to reach to the place, feel the vibes there, and then you can research you know, better. And, 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 and then you can take it to the next level because we all know that Pir Abdul Ghulani was you know, long time before the times of Guru Nanak. How did it happen? Where did these names come from? And then that's a detailed discussion which I have provided in the, in the book. And then many of the Gurdwaras have Urdu inscriptions. So I try to highlight that, show to the people that, hey, don't just think it's a Sikh Gurdwara only, that uh, was paid by, you know, money was given by Sikhs. The Urdu was also being utilized. If you carefully see this Gurdwara, by the way, you see it's multicolored now. I'm almost sure it is being done by the Peer place, which is right next to it. This is a standard, standard uh, their technique. First, they will color it. And then in a few years, I will see the color starts turning towards green. So the religion of the buildings also gets slowly converted and the local peer will start putting some mazar there and it will become like a local Muslim traditional place. I have been uh, helplessly able to watch the transition of these buildings for last decade or so. Okay, so and another, like this is Chubacha Ram Rai. Ram Rai, we all know, seventh Guru's son. Uh, we can use these kind of places in Pakistan to establish the whole story around Dara Shiko. Uh, I, I covered, if you see the bottom of this page, I covered Khulasat Uttavrikh, that's by Sujan Rai Pandari, and Muntkab Ab Lubab, that's by Khafi Khan, and how Aurangzeb was included, and how Raja Todramal, Mutasdi of the crown of Sarkar of Sarhend, Aurangzeb's, how Ram Rai went to Lahore and stayed at this place when he was one time going with Aurangzeb, and then later on what ha happened with uh, Ram Rai at Dehradun, Guru uh, Gobind Singh Ji's story, how the Masand story happened, and then Punjab court story. So we are able to link all these characters which are very commonly known in Pakistan and international books. Unfortunately, the Muslim history, the Islamic history had a very large budget. Any place in the world you go to the libraries, you will, feel, you will find a very large section of Muslim histories. These characters are very well known. Once we start connecting these places to those characters, it starts giving us a lot of uh, new room for further explorations. This is Gurdwara Kartarpur Sahib. Everybody knows that. But this gives me an... Uh, time or opportunity again to research the nearby place Gurdwara Pai Gurbak Singh, which is 83rd chapter of my book. Now, a lot of people in Pakistan blame the Sikhs that Sikhs supported the British in 1857 revolt. We know that Sikhs armies were used by 1857 revolt, but I tried to give them this clue here how the British used the Sikhs. Now, this is the same place inside that Gurdwara Gurbak Singh. Now, we all know about the Sakhi uh, Swami. It's like a Sikh book of prophecy. In that prophecy book, there was a line either inserted by British or used by British according to their own motive during 1857 that says, Shri Mukhpat Shahi Dasmi, 
I'll say it's translation. I bless the cap bearing foreigners to be the rulers who will rule over you according to their own will. Topi Tarjo Maleshke, Dehu Raj Samaj, Dotum Jotum Par Baltar, Ke Bohre Baje Baj means they are saying a quote from a Sikh book of prophecy that was very well um, believed by the Sikhs of that time that these people who are foreigners who are bearing the cap, they will come and they will rescue you. And it's being said by uh, 10th Guru, and he's saying, Guru Tegh Bahadur Ke Gurum Se Pargat Pe Ogerai, means this was the wish of the ninth Guru. And then Captain William Hudson, you know, the British intelligence officer who shot the last Mughals in Delhi at um, uh, the Hamayu's tomb, uh, the Mirza Mughal, Khizr Sultan and Abu Bakr. By the way, when I use these names in presentations at Pakistan universities, all students start showing interest in things because they know about these last Mughals who were killed by British. So what I found is that George Hudson in his book written in 1860 writes very clearly where he put the dead body of those three Mughals. He says, it was on this spot that the head of Guru Teg Bahadur had been exposed by the Orang Zayb's order. The Sikhs considered that in attacking Delhi, they were paying off an old score. A prophecy had been long current among them that by the help of white men, they should reconquer Delhi. After this, they looked down Captain Hudson, who, whose actual name was William Stephen Rakes, as the avenger of the martyred Guru and were even more ready than before to follow him anywhere. So with this, I'm able to make a point that it was just not that the Sikhs were working in the army and they started following them. They were utilized in a way by showing these prophecies that now Britishers are the avengers of uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur's martyrdom because the body of those three Mughals was exposed at the same place where uh, ninth Guru was um, uh, martyred. And also in my work, if you see the book name is The Sikh Heritage Beyond Borders. But if you see the index, if you see the first names, Abdullah Mubarak Al Marwazi, Abdul Ahad Khan, Abdul Aziz Nakai, Abdul Qadir Gilani, Abdul Qasim Khan, Abdul Rahman, Abdul Samad Khan, Achar Singh Jathidar. So after seven names, a Sikh name comes. Means I have been able to weave the Muslim stories among the Sikh characters in this book to give it an international flavor, to give it a wider audience that it's all connected. You know, the history, you can't say Sikh history, Muslim history, Hindu history, all these uh, things were uh, connected in a way. And I try to use the ancient sources, uh, like in Urdu Farsi, Jawahari Fridi, Tuzgirat Oliya, Khazana Amira, Lahore Sikhon Ke Admeh, Taki Ke Chishti, Israre Khudi, Mantuk Abil Lwab. These are very well known books, international level. The translation of those books at many places was done first time to be quoted in the, in the, in the Sikh work. Uh, now this is Abtabad, very close to this place, Bin Laden was caught. And if you see still on the top, it's written in Urdu, Gurdwara building. So people have preserved these things. Now, this is very common. This is Rawal Pindi, Narankari Darbar from where Narankari sect started. If you see in Gurmukhi, it's written Ekumkar. They have not erased it. But on the top, the Arabic inscription from Quran is written. This is another building, Sargoda. If you see carefully on the very top of the towers, the Guru Khanda is still there. This is the close up. You can see the Khanda right there on the building tops. So what we have been achieved so far, did it yield any results? Let's say this is the Gurdwara Sahib. Yeah, this is about the Sakhi, Ujjar Jao, Vichar Jao, by Guru Nanak Dev Ji visited this place. In the book, when I published the book, I tried to give a lot of free copies to the nearby people. And a local person, a Muslim, he donated a large money for this Gurdwara construction. That is what I personally want, is that the Sikhs should not give money for the constructions of these buildings. I don't feel that appropriate because it's Pakistan. These people need to be made aware. And when they stand up, when they start putting some money in, then it's okay, we can do that. Otherwise, you know, we are spending so much money on buildings, buildings, buildings. There's zero um, budget for any scholarly works or research work. What are we going to do with all these larger buildings when there is no six Sangha there? But if the people in these local communities in Pakistan start coming up, then yes, then it makes sense because it makes them feel that, wow, we need to preserve these buildings. That's what we need to generate among them. Another example, there's a place called Mudali. If you see the building, it just look, looks like a almost you know, gone small dome. It's inside, you see Guru Gobind Singh Ji's nice frescoes. If you see on the lower right side, there is a picture of a British battle. I was very impressed recently. There is a, this uh, his architectural historian. It's a uh, architectural journal published from England. They used from my book, this picture on the lower right side on their cover page. So that helped us to bring the Sikh heritage on an international level at a inequality magazine on their cover page. And they also included, this is the actual magazine. This is their different issue. They used to you know, put some kind of um, uh, British old 
uh, you can uh, say something like that's really elegant. That was generally the place uh, they used to put there. But now this time, they, in this particular issue, they are using a picture from a Sikh monument in Pakistan. So now we connected the monument with the international uh, architecture, architectural historians. And this is the whole feature they gave about the Sikh architect. What is Sikh architecture? This is my interview in that one, like, you know, what it means and what was it combining the uh, elements from Sikhism, Hinduism, and the British architecture. But the interesting thing is when I gave that thing, this is the person, he's the old man sitting in those fields where that building is located. How would it make him feel? This is actually my whole, my, I would say, my sense of contentment. Like this is where I enjoy the most. When the book or the work reaches those people who are living in Pakistan, hey, this thing, this small place, which is in your fields, in your cave, which you have preserved for 70 years, it has now made a international attention by being the cover on a page and, and, and in our book. That, that makes us just feel, feel good. Now, there's a different sect of people who love artwork, architectural heritage. There's is, there is a lot of that in Pakistan. And in and every place like this, I try to decipher it because if you see this picture, you will see a small pond being excavated and it says Nagar Tung. And I tried to explain it in English. Nagar Tung was the place from where land was donated when uh, for, uh, Fifth Guru Sahib, he was uh, constructing the uh, Guru Ram Das Jinnis Rover, the, his construction was done by Fourth Guru Sahib. So Nagar Tung was the place, was the nearby village from where the land was taken. So that's why the, the painter, the artist have given credit to the Nagar Tung. So by translating these inscriptions in these buildings, help the art students in Lahore or in big cities, or hopefully I'm trying to get attention of international art lovers, so that if we don't decipher these, these, these paintings, then they are just like, oh, Sikh art, then nobody cares there. This is artwork at Gurdwara, Dera Sab Lahore. Uh, once again, some Karseva people, you know, expanded it too much. I was right there. I was trying to stop demolishing of this thing, but uh, it's, it's not in, it's not possible. That those are those are different issues. Shekhupura Kela, it has beautiful art frescoes. This is village Alpa. It has these are full size life portraits of Sikh gurus, really big size, like, and they are outside. In, imagine all of the rain, everything happened. You know, still they have been maintained. This is uh, court. The Than Singh near Atak. If you see these inside, uh, next to Guru Rai Sahib, it says Pai Panua. Next to Guru Krishan Ji is Pai Bala Marvaha. We don't see these characters quite often. So once you start explaining these characters, then you know that where these characters were coming from, who were the prominent Sikhs of those times. This is Gurdwara Hadiara. Again, it has a lot of artwork frescoes. This is fight of um, battle between Shemi Pashai and Pende Khan. We were, I was able to explain it from the Patvahis what happened in this particular one. This is the 3D effect at Gurdwara Rodi Sahib. Now, for Sikh scholars, there are a lot of places in Pakistan where there are dissidents in Sikh history that you can do as much research you want. This is Mohammedipur. This is where Mir Banjan Sakhi was written by Menor Das. Menor Das is the name of, uh, uh, popularly, uh, Mir Bani. He's known as Mir Bani. He was the son of Prithi Chan, most of you know. Gurdwara Talis a very large following in Sindh. A lot of people who are Seva Panthis, uh, Nanak Panthis, they still, uh, you know, follow uh, um, Guru Nanak Dev Ji's son, uh, Baba Shri Chand. So this is his place. Tali Sahib, as you see, it's now converted, but I was able to locate this place and I wrote the whole history about him. And then Heher Pind, this is where Prithi Chand had tried to build something like a replica of Srovar of Darbar Sahib. This is that place in the Prithi Chand's village, we were able to locate that. Then Chubacha Ram Rai, which I just explained to you earlier, now, this is Nankana Sahib, everybody knows, but right next to is there is Balle Daku. This is where the whole story started about this Balla controversy, both Balla Janam Saki. Sky is the limit. That's where at Chandrapan, Sandhu's place, you know, you, you can find these links all connected. You know, you can you can explore as much as, as much you want. Then there are Gurbani composition sites. This is Sialkot. This was the house of Mula Khatri, where Guru Sahib wrote this um, composition. This is Gurdwara Panjami Pashai Rangmel, where Guru Sahib wrote this composition. Gurdwara Manji Sahib where Guru Sahib wrote this composition. And you can start even finding the linguistic variation. As Guru Sahib is traveling, he's composing according to what is happening with him in the last few months, like a poet. He's putting that into his writing. And we can see the effect of local language if you if you work on these. This is Vanjarya Wali Sakhi. Now, these Sakhis could have been created later on also as a way to you know promote the piety among the Sikh people. That may not be even true, which I tried to cover how to, how to analyze this thing. This is where Panjami um, Pashai, uh, he stayed uh, when he was sent by Guru Ramdas Ji. This is again Mia Mitha Walisaki. 
And then there were a lot of mistakes I found in the earlier text. This is called Gurdwara Pat Pali Patshah in many books. Whereas this is the place where the biggest fight happened during Gurdwara Singh Sabha movement because this was place of Pai Pirthi. He was the, the Mahant here was the head of the Udasi Mahamandal. And the fight was, at, you know, it's really sad to see all the records from the uh, British Library, all those legal fight about 10 years from 1922 to around 1932. At the end, the you can find it almost, you know, common in all the different court cases that who is a Sikh? What is the definition of a Sikh? If the Tat Khalsa was saying you have to be Amritari, then this place, which had 700 acres, it was being held by Pai Pirthi originally, who was not Amritari Sikh. So Sikhs were in a very difficult position and their council was changing the stance a lot, lot of time. At the very end, sadly, you will find that the judge is saying, okay, if you have Guru Granth Sahib only, then that's a Sikh place. So that's when the monks started taking Shri Guru Granth Sahib away. Though many of many people see it as a celebration, but uh, sadly what I see is that we lost a lot of these places as in which were the nucleus of spreading Sikhism in the early times. Yes, many of them got corrupted, but I still feel something was not happening right in the Sikh history. If you, in those 30, 40 years, I think uh, we got into a severe loss because the conversions from Hinduism to Sikhism stopped during this period because of establishing the identity crisis. This is the same Gurdwara. Now, Pai Taru Singh Shahid, everybody goes to uh, Lahore and they pray here that this was the place where Pai Taru Singh Ji martyred, got martyred. But I researched that this was not the place. This is where he was scalped. He was taken away by six for, and he stayed for three weeks in this place where he was uh, received by, um, uh, you know, Z Zakriya Khan also sent his uh, ambassador there, uh, Pai Shubhaik Singh, and that's where he achieved the martyrdom. So these were two different places because there was a big narrative happened when Zakriya Khan sent someone, he had this um, uh, urinary problem and the discussion happened about giving some thing in return if uh, Pai Taru Singh does not curse him. So this is not the place where he achieved martyrdom. This is where he was scalped, but this is the place where it's nearby. It's called Farukia Gali now. So I have given two different chapter site where he was scalped and site where actually he achieved martyr martyrdom. This was written by many books that he was a thief or something, Pajmayat Singh, but we found he was a uh, Kuka Lair, the very famous person. And now a lot of people from India, they started giving attention to the work because of this person from Kuka Lair. I'll just take five more minutes. Um, Empowering the youth, how to do that? What I do is, you know, I do a lot of online classes for the students, especially the question is how to tackle the miracles because the students in Western world, they question, oh, how did the snake come? You know, how, what happens? How, do our, how are these miracles when we say science, Sikhi is a very scientific religion? I try to connect with the same traditions from Islamic Sufism. Let's say this is the Buddha Kawa, in which the Sikh says that there was a Sikh whose um, uh, bricks were, he had a kiln, whose bricks were not well formed and but they were sold because of a blessing by Guru Arjun Dev Ji. But in Pakistan's books, the same story is associated, if you read the book there, uh, due to Sai Miamir. He, according to a competing legend I have written, Buddha Shah once refused to give Abdul Haq, a follower of Sai Miamir, shelter. In response to refusal, Abdul Haq cursed Buddha Shah for unbaked bricks, which was later negated by Sai Miamir. So you can find almost every Sakhi which is non-scientific in Sikh tradition, the similar version of it in Sufiana, it's just the name of differences. But it's a way to say it. This is my grandma when I took her to Pakistan. But when I saw her standing here in cold water, praying to that uh, hand replica of Guru Nanadev Ji Panja Sahib, I thought of presenting these things very carefully, you know, how to uh, counter these sakis, which are sometimes non-scientific. It, it's a trick which I have tried to utilize in my book. These are some other abandoned buildings in Pakistan. And uh, you, if you can see, now the building makes sense. It was summer residence of Maharaj Singh. If you just see this building, it's gone. So the neighbors have still preserved these places. So this is my last slide. This is my recent now work. I'm trying to research all the literature that is sitting in Pakistan's libraries, private places. And I'm trying to compile a catalog of it, trying to see what is, um, I, I'm not able to show some of those things which I feel might be precious, but I, you know, it's still the work is in progress. So this is my uh, current work where I have been able to secure rooms in some libraries where I'm securing, making it accessible to the international Sikh historians. They can visit that place, they can research. Uh, that, that is the current work that, that we are working on. Uh, this is uh, another manuscript which I found very interesting, Shri Guru Granth Sahib, which has the colored pictures uh, inside of Guru Sahib. Uh, this is our team. This is how we may am working. This is the library. And, and uh, I think that's it. And uh, this is the last slide. 
I'm trying to connect the historians in India and Pakistan through many online channels. I have friends on both sides. Everybody is willing. I think everybody is just waiting one day that India and Pakistan, uh, this, this overall political uh, environment improves. And the, I think the students and the historians, everybody just can't wait enough to, to get into the other territories to explore it further. Thank you so much. I look forward to your uh, critical feedback. All this work needs critical feedback from you so that I can maybe take it to the next level. I'm stuck. My, uh, I need some brainstorming. So whenever you guys get any chance, all of you are very experienced historians. Please send me your feedback. Thank you so much, Adam. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Panu. That was that was really amazing. I mean, just seeing the uh, the Muslim Shahada right next to the Ikon Kar. That was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. wow. That's pretty exciting for someone who's uh, been looking at Sikhi uh, from the Islamic studies perspective. Um, I will do my best to. Uh, give voice and make sure that we get as many of the Q&A questions as possible. And, and thank you uh, to the panelists, first of all, in general, thank you so much for sharing your research today, but also thank you for um, taking a look at the Q&A and, and providing some answers there, because that is also kind of part of the, the record that we're leaving and the, the brainstorming that we're able to do. Um, perhaps, let's see, perhaps we could start, you know, with the uh, uh, Mark Jurgens Meyer's uh, question, which was sent uh, earliest, so why not start there, if that's okay? Uh, this is for you, Dr. Nirvikar Singh. Uh, thanks Thank you. So, so um, uh, Mark's question is, uh, do you think that Sikh study scholars pay too much attention to the wider trends in academia? And if so, what is the antidote to that? So my answer is no, I don't think uh, we should uh, neglect uh, wider trends in academia. Uh, it's just a big challenge because, um, you know, there, there's a lot going on theoretically and at the same time one has to be, you know, very well grounded in, um, you know, the tools of the trade. I mean, you know, being able to, uh, you know, read sources in, in the original Punjabi or sometimes Persian and so on. So, so uh, it's a big challenge, I think, to be um, at the top of one's game as, as a scholar in six studies and many other interdisciplinary fields are the same. So, uh, but I, I don't think we should shy away from that. And uh, uh, perhaps the, uh, the solution really is to build a critical mass and uh, have you know, a, a lot more uh, people that we can talk to and uh, support each other and uh, have more con you know, constructive cr criticism and feedback. And that's how you amplify, amplify uh, you know, your, your personal knowledge and resources is by having great colleagues. So uh, I, I think that, that's the way forward. Excellent. Um, I wonder if we want to, would, would you be willing to answer uh, another one? Uh, and then maybe we can move to um, uh, a question for Connor. Would that be okay? Would you? Uh, yeah, I, actually, I, I think there's just two, two more for me. I'll answer them quickly. Uh, so uh, Dr. Harbansla named some diverse groups in Sikh community as example. I mean, there's the standard ones like, you know, uh, Amritari, Keshtari and so on, you know, McLeod did that. Other people have discussed that. Uh, uh, I'll be happy to send Jasteet Singh's article to anybody where he starts with McLeod and then expands, you know, onto diversity in the Khalsa. I mean, one, one, one could uh, do a lot of things with that question. And then uh, uh, Van's question about, is there, uh, is there some substantive scholarly work in Sikh studies that pr presents a full-fledged alternative historical analysis of the period, uh, you know, beyond uh, Harjot Obroy's? And uh, the answer is no, you know, it, it's, uh, one can put it together from a bunch of different sources. And that's what I realized in writing this paper, but uh, it, it remains to be done. Uh, it, but it, it's, not, it's not really super difficult, I think. And one can see some of the uh, elements of it in, in the, you know, book reviews by, uh, book review by Nikki Singh or, uh, uh, you know, the, the critique by Jatar Grewal. Okay, so now, now it, it should be Connor's turn, thank you. Thank you for fielding the questions. Um, so, uh, Connor, would you be willing to, um, and, and I see that you're already typing an answer to uh, Puninder Singh, but would you uh, be interested in, in fielding the question? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm doing my best to answer the, the questions. Puninder's uh, question and then, and then Nicola Mooney's question, which I think are very similar, because uh, Puninder is asking, 
uh, whose gaze gets to be the ultimate arbiter of appropriateness, appropriateness morality, or legality, um, particularly in multicultural societies, as in like the multicultural society is largely a patchwork of ethnic groups where, you know, we have, okay, here we have our Punjabi representative who goes and speaks to the community and then presents their findings to the, the multicultural society, or you have various uh, indigenous tribes and nations who, who do the same. Um, it's, a, it's my perspective is that in that there's a very large, like very largely a top down way in which ethnic groups are represented to multicultural society, particularly like public figures who are made visible, whether it's, you know, Jagmeet Singh, who's the head of the New Democratic Party, um, or a very good friend of mine, Dr. Parminder Singh in Toronto, who runs a number of clinics and was also um, the founder of the Punjabi broadcast of Hockey Night in Canada, and he also broadcast the uh, the Warriors Toronto Raptors NBA finals from a few years ago in Punjabi. Um, it's just this strange setup in multiculturalism where um, both the Canadian state and the ethnic group are coming to a mutual definition of who is a, a, who is a member of that community. The Canadian state has a notion of who is a Sikh and then six have to sort of tailor their uh, their expressions or their expectations to not be, you know, too political or too noisy about Khalistan. Uh, Michael Najawan in his book, The Precarious Diasporas of Sick and Amdia Generations, uh, he calls this samosa politics, where there's a, a particular way in which people have to be uh, both ethnic enough while also being palatable. Um, and, and to Nicola Mooney's question, um, I, I open by saying, by, by critiquing the Sikh community way of um, sort of dif differentiating themselves from other communities. Um, this is something I'm kind of very polemical and perhaps a little controversial about in my opinion, which is that I feel personally that six, especially in North America, will do like a hashtag sick lives matter before they align themselves with black lives, before they will speak up about injustices in, in India, whether, you know, the farmers protest, the lack of a COVID response. Um, I attended protests in Vancouver and Surrey after um, the CAB and NRC, which you know, excluded the rights of citizenship to Muslims. Um, there were very few Sikhs at those protests. And there's this way in which, um, and this is not just Sikhs, this is just in multicultural society, groups are meant to look out for themselves because they see the system of power and they say, you know, I want to see myself represented in this system. And in order to get represented, they have to play to their community interests and balance this, you know, this is what the state wants and also am I doing a good job by my community. Um, I hope I'm not rambling too much with that, but that's my uh, sort of hot take. Um, yeah, thanks. And do you want to, um, it looks like you're getting in conversation with uh, Dr. Hawley as well. Um, was that something uh, we'd like to, uh, you'd like to respond to? Um, the most, re I mean, I work on very, very contemporary, like as contemporary as I can. Um, I know there were labor protests, I think in the 80s between, uh, like solidarities between Punjabis in, like throughout British Columbia, particularly in um, Abbotsford, and then sort of collaborations with indigenous nations in that. Um, that's something I need to research a bit more into because like it's this sort of like high identity politics that I'm calling out, I think really only became salient in the 1990s onwards. 
And if you look before the 1990s, there's a lot more solidarities, like in the UK, for example, of you know, the, the label black, not just referring to people who are descendant from the continent of Africa, but black is also basically any non-white subject. And those sort of get separated out after, you know, uh, the, the Iranian revolution of 1979, 1984, of course, the Air India bombing in 1985, the rise of the Mujahideen in the 90s in Afghanistan and all the way to the present. Um, it's something, I, I believe your historical hunch is right, uh, Michael Hawley, when you say the indigenous Sikh connections are there. Uh, I haven't done enough reading on that to, to be able to say yes or no. Interesting possible avenue for research there. Um, I do want to field if we have some questions for Dr. Panu. Um, I, I know I've got a lot of questions <laughs> just because um, I know a, a handful of stories about Abdul Qadir al Jilani, um, but I'll, I'll hang on to those. Um, sure. um, so I, I wonder if we can read this as a question. Um, uh, Dr. Malotra, uh, first of all, says, incredible work, Dr. Panu. I wonder if there's a way to preserve the buildings, the frescoes that are also disappearing. Uh, yes, uh, great question, Dr. Malhotra. Uh, you know, one way is like whenever any building is about to fall that cannot be preserved, that particular section which has excellent artwork, it can be taken to Lahore Museum, like they have from many other ancient buildings. But the problem is with the car seva groups that are coming from India, they don't let us even stand there. I have tried to block them sometimes very close, but it's extremely difficult. The other option is to get those 3D, like, you know, how the kids play the video games. So there are about 16 buildings in Pakistan, which are valuable from Sikh heritage, Sikh artwork point of view, which I'm working on. I'm trying to make an app so that anyone can visit these buildings virtually and move around. So that is the work in progress to digitalize them, uh, to make them available in a, in a 3D fashion. It's a bit... Uh, it's a slow process because it's not easy, because many of them are residences, people are living in there. Uh, you have to make friends with them and slowly, you know, you just can't pay the money and it's not like that. So that's what it's taking, taking some time. And uh, uh, by the way, Dr. Malhotra, with your uh, book help, like, you know, I was learn, able to learn more about uh, Gulab Dasis. I was able to find that place, uh, Piro and Glass, uh, the, the, the girl's story. So my work is not only about just uh, mainstream Sikhism, to locate those places in Pakistan is my passion. And then eventually at some point, you know, we can make like a, a roadmap of all those places, either it's Hiranja or it's Soni Mehwal, like uh, anything, Mirza Sahib, huh? you, you name it, like all those folk stories, which are uh, often read in Indian side of the place also. Near Kasur, it was very interesting to find the place where Piro used to live. We were able to go to their home at that place where now the current Muslim families live. We were able to make friends. I tried to gain friends with all those places who are living in these places so that at one point, you know, we can get access to these places. Thank you. That's so fascinating. Um, I think we have uh, another question. Um, perhaps Dr. Tandy uh, th wants to thank you, first of all, um, for your excellent presentation. Your work is a fantastic example of why we need more research in classical Sikh studies to better understand the evolution of the Sikh tradition. Absolutely. And I also wonder, I, I forgot to allow the panel a chance if you want to respond to one another's paper, uh, papers or your presentations. Um, I, I do wanna make sure that I give you that opportunity as well. I just want to thank both Connor and Irwag are saying like, you know, I truly learned a lot. It's such amazing. I often, you know, has always been thinking to somehow reach out to them and today it was interesting for me to learn no, not like so we always speak our own paper but the actual advantage of these kind of conferences is to learn from other people because when you're sitting here no matter what you can't you know focus somewhere else so it was great to hear both of you, Thank you. yeah Thank you. It, this was a really good example of diversity uh, increasing the benefits of being together because i learned a lot from uh, connor and from dr Penman. Thank, Thank you yeah thank you both i'm i'm very interested Dr. Singh, to spend more time with your uh, paper that you shared with all, all of us, and then uh, Dilvir Virji to look up your book, because uh, that is just an incredible wealth of resources that you've put together. I do want to make sure, um, am I missing any questions in the Q&A? 
because I've got about a million questions about um, shared sites of worship between uh, perhaps Sufis and, and Sikhs. Yeah, yeah. But I, I do want to make sure that I, I let the uh, senior scholarly community uh, ask the questions first. I was, so I'm wondering uh, if, if uh, unless you spot some other questions, um, do, what sort of, do you see that relationship? I'm most curious to know if it still exists, if you still, for example, see, um, you know, intercommunal visitation of shrines, um, if that still uh, exists, because I, I remember um, reading a lot of fascinating examples, you know, whether it's Akbar discussing um, um, with one of the gurus or, uh, Mian Mir, you know, and his, his famous relationship. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that, if you'd be willing to. Sure, it's actually, it's great. Pakistan is the only place where we can see this still happening, as we know, it, during Islam also, when it started by originally Southern Punjab by Sheikh Freed, for first few centuries, they even allowed the people to keep idols at their home. It was not uh, too fanatic. And when Naqshbandis came in the 16th century, 17th century, that's when they started removing the idols. So first few generations, were very liberal and they were not even, uh, you know, you talk about the first few, even up to the Tughlaq period, they were not even taking any patronage from New Delhi. It started all after that in the Pak Patan's Khanka. So you can see a lot of these places where people still like in Sindh region, you will see Guru Granth Sahib Ji and people will go and walk underneath. They will roll like as if a chule, like, you know, as it's a swing of a uh, chule lal. And even the Muslim and Hindu traditions you can see in Sindh connected to, to one place. So I think Sindh is one place in the world where you can understand how Sikhism involved from Hinduism because a lot of them mutual conversions are still happening and the worship places are also the same. And still in Indian Punjab, I see that at a local level, I whole life I lived in a very small village, especially the ladies, the women. Whenever there is a, you know, somebody is sick or something mishappen happens, they go with their neighbors, either they're going to Hindu temple or they're going to this Pir Di Jaga. People still visit these places, though it's a Hindu, it's a Sikh or Muslim, but all people in the rural Punjab have been visiting other places. Like there are small places like Guge Pir Di Jaga, Flanne Ji Jaga. Like these are not mainstream places. Baba Balaknath Di Jaga. These were the places I'm telling from my village. And people have been praying, praying on, like, you know, pray at the time of the need. They will do whatsoever they do to do. So those places, I think, act more like a pluralistic places of uh, religion and I, I find it very actually fascinating and I tell them to you know able to sometimes spend time with them and I would stay at those places in their in their way and that's actually how my personal journey also started going to Spain and to Portugal to see how the Christianity and Islam interface happened you know uh, that's how my journey started too. Oh wow oh, wow that reminds me of the shrines of Fatima <laughs> in, yeah. you mentioned Spain. Um, I think we will probably wrap it up there. Uh, give us a break before the uh, the last session of the day. Um, thank you so much. I, this is uh, this was a brilliant panel, and, and thank you so much. It, I learned a lot from all of you. Thank you, Adam. <laughs>